Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Rebecca McDonald and I will be your MC for the session in the strategy stream. So yes, just to confirm, this is the strategy stream where we will be talking about how we use APIs to achieve better business performance and better customer outcomes. We have a fabulous session planned, so please do make sure your friends and colleagues know where you are. And whilst it might not seem so important right now, I'd love to suggest that you do make sure you switch your phones to silent so that you can sit back and indulge in this session with us. In this session, we'll be hearing from Janet Liao from Talent, two of my fellow Deloitte colleagues, Liz Douglas and Saul Kaganoff, and finally, Dr. Amaru Maruotona from Aculus. I mentioned that I will be working, that I also work with Deloitte, and I'm the Talent Acquisition Manager for our platform engineering business and resident unicorn whisperer. My passions are very much focused around attracting incredible talent, engaging them with our story, our team, and our opportunities, and then ensuring that once they join, they want to stay. Whilst I've run many an interview with many technical superstars, yes, I have all the buzzwords in my repertoire, it's safe to say that I'm feeling ever so slightly out of my league in your presence this afternoon. Fortunately, I have connected with all of our speakers this afternoon, and I'm going to be very comfortable in allowing them to take the floor, and I promise to stay very quiet. <laughs> Each speaker will have 25 minutes. With five minutes at the end, um, we'll, I'll happily present any of your questions. So please don't leave me hanging, send through your questions on the chat, and I'll endeavor to cover as many as we can. I'd like to introduce our first speaker in this session, Janet Liao. Janet is the Principal Product Marketing Manager for Asia Pacific Talent. Talent is a data integration and data integrity company who enable businesses to find clarity amidst their data chaos. Janet has always applied a strategic lens to her work and complements this with multidisciplinary expertise in digital technology and regional product marketing. She has a wealth of experience in the telco industry in Singapore and has most recently ventured into the Silicon Valley. Janet also tells me that she once took a 10 minute holiday in Hawaii after 16 hours of flying. That sounds like one epic flight story, but I think I know a few people who would gladly take 10 minutes in Hawaii right now. <laughs> so today, Janet is sharing with us her secrets on how to make the data you use for your critical business decisions accessible, clean and compliant. Please welcome Janet Liao. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Hi everyone, um, I'm Janet from Talent. I'm the product marketing lead for APEC that includes um, Australia, New Zealand, ASEAN and Japan. Nice to meet you. So um, let me just share my screen for today's presentation. Just give me a minute. All right, so um, I'm sure you have heard a lot about API from the other speakers before me over the course of today and yesterday. So today, what I'll really like to talk about is that the value of an API is that it facilitates a very standardized way of organizing and sharing data with both external and internal stakeholders. But what I would like to do is to extend the discussion beyond a purely API-only view and show you what it takes not just to standardize and share the data, but also to collect, govern, and transform data across the enterprise in supporting critical business decisions. So today, I have my colleagues Nadine and Ali here with me in this webinar. Ali is our pre consultant and Nadine is our ANZ marketing manager. We are all happy to take any questions during the Q&A session, or you can also type in any questions into the global chat bar where Nadine and Nad Ali will help me to also answer as I'm walking through the presentation. Okay, so now let's start off. Let's talk a little about the data management landscape today. All right. We know that the diversity of data is flourishing. There are, you know, a lot more different types of data. For example, structured versus unstructured data types. There are a lot more different type of databases, you know, relational or non-relational. Different deployment platforms whereby you have public cloud setup, private or hybrid cloud setup, as well as use cases. So you can have a 360 view of customer and product or data warehouse migration or even IoT use case. And this increase in data diversity leads to data management complexity over time. And what we are observing is that there are four key areas of challenges, okay? The first being integration challenges. So 
The development of organizational silo data, whether if it is across a cloud or on-prem setup, or even you know, multiple data lakes within the organization. There's also the technical challenge. So we know that from Forrester, there are 12 times as many unfilled data engineering jobs as data scientists position. And that data engineering gap is outstripping the supply of data engineers. And for organizations, the key difficulty today is really with operationalizing or sustaining or even orchestrating data pipeline across multiple execution environments. The third area of challenge comes from governance. So we are observing increasing regulatory oversight across industry on data privacy protection and users. So for example, the GDPR, the BCBS 239, or something which is more industry specific. In Australia, you have the Privacy Act of 1988. And that was introduced to promote and protect the privacy of individuals and regulate how the government agencies and organizations use data. In New Zealand, the new Privacy Act will take effect from the 1st of December 2020 and replace the existing Privacy Act of 1993. Now, what we are seeing is that, sorry, and the last challenge that we're seeing is that as data becomes a more ingrained part of our life, more stakeholders within the organization expect access to it and use it, you know, from analysis to planning, whether if it is on a working or management level and a cross function within the organization. And with this landscape, data chaos is the result. And what are the implications of data chaos for companies? First, fragmentation is the first implication. The IT landscape and organization is getting more and more fragmented with more data, you know, across different types of data location and sources. According to IDG, the average company has 400 plus sources of data and six tools to manage it. And in some of our larger customers, um, two digit, you know, that is not uncommon from what we observe. And one of the underlying worry beyond practical concern is really keeping track of these data sources and tools. And also, how do you ensure that your entire business is on the same page and relying on the same set of data to make critical business decisions? And with fragmentation comes data quality and governance issues. When there are too many data silos, it is difficult to implement a common data quality and governance framework across board. And as a result of the lack of data quality, data is less valuable than it can be. And bad data causes companies on average 30% of their revenue. And I think more worrying, almost three quarters of the data in an organization does not get used when they are not in view of IT. With the lack of governance, shadow IT is another concern. Each department runs its own project and that leads to multiple tools and a overall slowing down of the organization's responsiveness. And as such, you know, some business units may get tired of IT to help and get their own unauthorized solution. And I think more importantly, when projects are running in vacuum and they don't build capabilities you know, on top of each other for the organization, you have an issue there because, for example, you can't make agile organizational challenge changes if each decision involves updating over 20 tools before you can leverage on the data itself. So shadow IT is estimated to cost business close to $2 trillion every year. Finally, it is difficult for organizations to keep up with accelerating change of technology. It is much more difficult to move your data to the cloud and take advantage of the latest analytics platform if you are beholden to a legacy data management solution that is difficult to migrate from an on-prem setup. And nearly half of digital transformation projects fail and only 10% ends up exceeding expectations. So while the vast majority of organizations recognizes the value of investing in their data and getting value from it, only 30%, less than a third, are able to do this effectively. Now, let's come back and see how this gel together with API. So in order to leverage the company's data set to achieve data digital transformation initiative, 
Most companies, IT, understand that there's a need to democratize data and uses API to deliver the requested data pipeline in a standardized and real-time format to the different business LOBs, usually either you know, based on an analytics or operational-based use case. And to take a closer look at what usually happens in companies that embark on this API journey. On the analytics part of the value chain that you see at the top, as data is refined into information, then into digital intelligence, such as insights or prediction, what we see here is that APIs are a key enabling technology to connect those use cases in real time and is leveraged for reporting, decision making, data science, even AI deployment. And you can see the API connectivity at every step. Some of it is already built in, while others need to be created. On the operational path at the bottom, Data is fueling the core business and existing business process supports and deliver digital interaction and experiences that serve not only the customers, but also external partners and internal employees. Therefore, API is a critical building block to synchronize and compose data into high value, real time and consistent digital services across multiple channels of interaction, whether it is mobile or web, you know, to connect a device or even another partner's API to facilitate self-service business development. Finally, API bridges both layers together in terms of the analytics with the operational use case and enable the reuse of master data in application. Or, you know, they can be used to augment customer experience in real time. So, for example, with a product purchase recommendations algorithm produced by a data science team, which is executing in real time as the customer fills up his shopping cart. So APIs are everywhere, helping to connect the digital value chain and gaining popularity um, as technology trends such as microservices architecture leads to the reflector, refactoring of applications into ever smaller and reusable API building blocks. And ultimately, and organization actually needs an industry approach to API delivery and governance. Now, <clears throat> from an IT point of view, okay, an API-first approach to managing data provides the following benefits. I'm not going to touch uh, you know, in details of each, but I think just a quick you know, skim through. Um, it enables development team to really work in parallel because after the API contract is created between services, different teams within the organization can work on multiple APIs at the same time, and the developers do not need to wait for an update to an API to be released before moving on to the next API. And second, in terms of reducing the development cost, because API and its code can be reused on many different projects, when a development team wants to build a new app, they don't have to start from scratch, which is time consuming and costly. Third, it reduces time to market because much of the process of building APIs can be automated using tools that allow the import of API definition files. So with those files, you know, API tools such as the SDK documentation or mock API can be auto-generated. And automation significantly speed up the development of API and its application. An API-first approach also makes it possible to add new services and technology to applications quickly without having to re-architect the entire system. The last part is really an API reduces a developer's learning curve when it is well-designed, well-documented, and consistent because it is so much easier to reuse the code and shorten the learning curve with good documentation. So the increase in the efficiency of the IT team from API implementation ultimately translate to enabling companies and making their data more accessible across the organization as a whole. However, the question is, is just API sufficient in managing data? When we observe you know, the varied use cases that are arising in today's um, organization with, res with respect to data, Despite an API-first approach, the API implementation is actually at the end of the iceberg, so as to speak, at the end of the data value chain. So in reality, 
Um, IT is tasked with multiple use cases, which has varying data requirements and dimensions. And the expectation of the data is different from stakeholders to stakeholders. So for example, you can see here, um, compliance project, you know, which is required by the legal hit, will require more governance elements such as lineage tracking and data protection. While IoT project, you know, which can be lead by the CEO or the product head, it requires data to be more real-time with latency requirements, you know, as well as being able, say, to process massive amount of data at the edge of the network. So every different use case will trigger a set of different but related data management dimensions or requirements from IT. And to be more specific, let's go into a use case today, all right, on Customer 360. So let's look at the 360 use case where we have three different groups of stakeholders. You can see here IT, marketing, and legal, all right? And each of them have different expectation of how the data will be used. And more on top, importantly, what is the characteristics of that data that needs to be delivered? Each of them will also have different expectation on the speed and the integrity of data. For example, for IT, you know, it is about how do we create a 360 customer view and based on all, jowling together all the different silo system within the organization, you know, how do we make sure that data is protected and has a minimal data quality? You know, for marketing, it can be how do we try and leverage on that 360 profile to upsell or cross-sell more so as to increase our revenue? You know, for legal, it can be, you know, how can we apply um, the act, you know, the Data Privacy Act, the Data Protection Act, and implement it with managing the data within the organization? You know, how do we know that in the event of data breach, you know, how do we track that breach and, you know, how do we let customers or the authorities know at which point did that breach happen? So other than making data accessible via API, we actually need to make data compliant and clean for a more complete decision making when it comes to critical business decision. Now, let's go in a little deeper. All right, so as I explained earlier, API is really very much at the end of the data value chain and what we call the sharing stage, all right? So other than the sharing stage, there are three more stages before the sharing stage whereby data, the final data comes out in a very clean and compliant stage. And that is collect, govern, and transform. Okay, so um, to go into each of the steps quickly, all right, so that you can understand how data goes from collect, govern, and transform all the way to then the API implementation. The first step, collect, is really all about data capture, ingestion, integration, all right, and that's really the most fundamental step. But in addition, during this phase, there are other steps such as discovering the data that's required, you know, using standardized, you know, the type of profiling and pattern recognition using, say, maybe inbuilt AI or ML algorithm, which enabling the documentation and categorizing of data automatically. An initial assessment of data quality can also be made at this stage using trust metrics or indicators, you know, such as a trust score, which is a really important dimension. Second, as we move into govern from collection. So governing the data is paramount because this is where we take control of the data and create a place where all your data assets is documented. So that the data is certified, it is protected with data ownership. And you know, it, in some cases, you can work on documenting that data and governing that data collaboratively with other stakeholders within the organization, say between IT and business. A set of data quality policies can also be defined here and applied to the data. So for example, there might be certain sensitive PII themes that you might want to mask during this governed stage. This is also where the data controller, as a data controller, one can track and trace all data flow within the organization. And with end-to-end -end lineage that speaks you know, of the origin or the destination of that data. 
The transformation stage is the third stage after the governance stage. And this is where we can then create that golden record. After reconciliating and cross-referencing all the different data from the different databases, using data transformation, you know, such as you know, matching or survivorship of data records. Subsequently, all this golden record can then be stored, you know, whether it's in a data warehouse or in another database, whereby you can apply artificial intelligence or machine learning analytics to further enrich that data. And lastly, coming back to API. So now that that data has been planned, organized, governed, transformed, you can share it with the end consumer, okay, whether if it is a human or whether if it is another, you know, API, all right? This is how the entire customer 360 use case actually look, okay, from the top. When you look at, um, managing your data from an end-to-end value chain. Okay, so the data lifecycle, which I've just described, using the use case of the customer 360, is actually supported by the latest data management view that both Gartner and Forrester have of the market. And Gartner and Forrester call this approach the data fabric, all right? And this is one of the top 10 data and analytics technology trends that is, you know, upcoming. So what is the data fabric approach, All right? So when we distill it down to its essence, there are four tenets of the data fabric, which is common across different analyst definitions. First of all, a data fabric is actually a framework. It is not a technology, okay? It, it is able to encompass different type of architecture and technologies within its fold. Second, um, data patterns are actually automated, reused, and augmented in a data fabric approach. Third, you can govern and secure across different data and technologies in a data fabric. All right. So even though the silos, data silos exist everywhere, the fabric actually enable you to overlay a layer at the top and govern and secure the different data flows. And fourth, it supports strategic outcomes with faster and governed self-access to data. I think more importantly, a data fabric as an approach provides a way of addressing different stakeholders' pains and needs when it comes to data management. So to give you some examples, for the data architect and engineers, data chaos means that they have to deal with siloed disparate data sources. And the pain is really in learning how to use multiple tools or even, you know, doing manual hand coding to stitch the data together. And that leads to wasted time and resources. A data fabric has the capability to connect to different data applications, irrespective of the underlying coding that's used. And this cuts down technical training and development time drastically and optimizes IT resources. For the CIOs, the CDOs, data chaos means managing too many one-off projects. Although it's quick to deploy as, a, as an individual project, it actually slows down the overall company's response to critical business decision and prevents agility. Data Fabric is a data management platform that's meant to address data needs on a centralized basis as a platform, accelerating the time to market when different data capabilities demanded by different use cases can be caught for in a single platform. And third, for compliance officers, such as your legal, data chaos means that this group of users has a limited ability to trace the data lineage and access and ensure legal compliance. So a fabric actually ensures that the data protection technique, okay, such as masking, and lineage capabilities are present across the organization's data sources and provides accountability at the end of the day. Okay, so this is where I run out of time and this is where I stop. If you would like to find out more about how a data fabric work, please ping us and we can do a demo to you. Um, you know, Ali is able to help demonstrate to you and or you can just visit us at our virtual booth to find out a bit more if you're interested. So thank you very much for your attention and time and we have a few minutes for Q&A. Any questions from anyone? Thank you, Janet. Uh, yeah, please do forward through your questions. Uh, I, I do have one question uh, for you. Uh, 
so I wanted to ask um, if you've already have a, a data lake or legacy data warehouse, are there any hints on how to easily transform to a data fabric? Um, a data fabric, um, actually, a, you know, um, part of that data warehouse, sorry, um, data warehouse deployment is actually um, part of what a data fabric connects to. So, you know, that data warehouse can, will be, say, for example, the destination of the end data that is received um, by the stakeholders which live, who leverages on that data warehouse. Sorry, am I? Okay. You want to clarify a bit more? That, 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 that sounds good. I, um, I also wondered, uh, where have you seen the data fabric approach used really well? What's, uh, what particular scenarios do you feel that that works best? Well, I think, you know, the data fabric can address a variety of data use cases. I think um, pretty commonly what we see in our customers, you know, could be a on-prem to cloud migration. It could be a analytics, you know, use cases whereby the companies are trying to really leverage on the latest analytics to apply to a set of data sources that we already have internally. Or, you know, it can be even a 360 use case as you saw earlier just now, you know, which I walk you through, you know. Yeah, okay. So it is really pretty wide ranging. <laughs> All right. Fantastic. Uh, I don't see any further questions coming through. Did anyone have anything further they'd like to ask before we let Janet go? I can't see anything. So thank you very much for your time, Janet. Thank you very much.